morning, Lord. Um, help be with us. Prepare our hearts and our minds, Lord, to hear what it is that you have for us. And Lord, help us to um, be more diligent in following you. In your name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Take your Bibles, though, and uh, turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20 is where we're going to be at today. John chapter 20. We find some rather remarkable events that take place in John chapter 20. On the morning of the day, we see it recounted that, that, a, that, that Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb and finds the tomb empty. Um, Pastor Jared was reading from, from Matthew this morning, and it mentions Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, which was kind of an odd name to give to the other Mary. At least she got mentioned in Matthew, you know. Um, <laughs> John seems to just kind of overlook her, the fact that she was even there. But uh, nevertheless, what we see is, is, is the account really from the, from the viewpoint of Mary Magdalene. Um, and Mary Magdalene had gone to the tomb, and the tomb was empty. And she goes there, and she she uh, she returns to tell the disciples. And the disciples, John and Peter, run out. And of course, John is the one to mention that he got there before Peter. Um, and then uh, he he gets there. They 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 also verify that the tomb is empty. And John leaves it at the at the idea that they just go away, not really understanding what took place, except for except for Mary. Mary lingered, and Mary actually saw the Lord, and Mary actually spoke to the Lord, and she comes back with that. But that's the, all of that happens in the morning, and we, we're going to pick it up in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23, and what we find is what happens later in that evening. So starting in verse 19, we'll read down through verse 23, and the Word of God says this, So while it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and while the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. And the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Heavenly Father, as we come before your word today, Lord, we, we are subject to it, God. We, are, we come to it fearfully, Lord, seeking to glean what you desire for us to learn from your word. And in this text, in this brief text, Lord, I pray that you, would, that you would show us the glory, the power, and the majesty of your resurrection. And Lord, what that entails for, for us, your church. God, help us, fill us with, with a knowledge, Lord, of, of the Lord through this. Fill us with a desire to do that which we are commanded to do and that which we have the privilege to do. Fill us with a zeal to declare the gospel of your kingdom. Lord, as we go forth in the coming weeks. And Lord, let us see the goodness of God as, as you are, are displayed here, that we might worship you more, sincere, more sincerely and more genuinely. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> so we start off with verse 19, and it says this. It says, so while it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and while the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. I'd like to, I'd like to just note the context of this passage uh, because it, it, it sort of casts um, an understanding of, of, of what the atmosphere was like for these disciples on, in, on this day. It had been just a few days since their Lord had, had died. They'd seen him crucified, at least the ones who remained behind and saw it, the ones who actually viewed it in person. But, but nonetheless, Jesus had been crucified. He had had his hands nailed to the cross. He had had thorns smashed onto his head. He had had a spear run through his side without even twitching. He was dead. The Romans were very good at what they did, and they made sure that he was dead. 
And so the disciples are, are gathered in this room, and they are, they, they are gathered, it says. It's a, they, they are gathered with the doors shut. And it, 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 they, they were gathered with the doors shut for the, fear, for the fear of the Jews. They were terrified of the Jews. On that day, this points us back necessarily to what happened earlier that day. What happened earlier that day? Well, what happened earlier that day? On the day, on the same day, it was on that day that John has just been telling us about. On that day, the, where the women, the women went early to, uh, to the grave early in the morning to minister to Jesus. It was on that day when they got there, they found the stone rolled away. It was on that day where John specifically mentions Mary Magdalene as having discovered the empty tomb. And she ran back and to tell the disciples. It was on that day, Peter and John ran, uh, had run to the, to, to the tomb and saw that it was empty. It was on that day that Mary had lingered and seen Jesus, the risen Christ, and spoke with him face to face. It was on that day where she went back and told the disciples what had happened. And on that day... On that day, the disciples had not yet seen him. But other than those things, it was just like any other day, right? No, it was a pretty significant day, and they were, they were terrified of what was going on. What was going on, they were terrified because just a few days before, they had seen Jesus crucified. And they were afraid of the same Jews who crucified Jesus would come in and, and, and deal with them in a similar fashion. They were also on that day, they were, they, were, they were terrified, they were meeting together, but they were terrified because the body of Jesus had gone missing. Now Mary had claimed to have seen him raised again, but the disciples had not seen that. And so whatever was going on in their mind, they knew that one thing would happen, sure enough, that the authorities would be looking for the body of Jesus. And given what, what Pastor Jared read this morning, what was, the, what was the rumor that was being spread about who had the body of Jesus? Oh, his disciples came while we were asleep and took him away. So guess whose door they will be knocking on to find the body of Jesus? Oh, they had good reason to be afraid. They had good reason to be terrified. These, these disciples were, 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 were together and they were scared. But I want to, you know, I, I know that there's, um, we might be tempted to think that, oh, well, they were scared. That represents sort of a flaw in their character. No, that, that's not the flaw in their character. Uh, they, they, were doing any, they were doing the same things that you and I would be doing. They would be scared out of their, out of their shoes, out of sandals, whatever. They'd be scared witless. And, and, yet, and yet the text says that they were still meeting together, even though they were terrified. You know, as I was preparing for this text, I was reading some, through some old, uh, some old commentators and, 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 and things, and um, reading from some old uh, Puritan uh, authors who talk about this text, and they, der they derived great comfort from the fact that even though it was a terrifying situation for them to be gathered, they were gathered nonetheless. You know, there may be a day in the United States, and that day may be coming pretty quickly, where it will not be easy for us to meet together, because maybe the authorities will be looking for us. Maybe we'll be another one of the 11. <laughs> maybe the FBI will be knocking on our door for something that that we did in righteousness, but that which uh, the, the wicked people of this world seek to, uh, seek to fight against. Yes, they were, they were afraid. They were locked in, in, in a room together, and they were afraid of the Jews. But let's give them a little credit. They were together. They were together, though they had questions. They didn't have it all figured out. They were together even though people were looking for them. They had not yet fleed the city. They were together. They were together. And a glorious thing happens. A glorious thing happens. It says, when they were together, that Jesus appeared. And what we see in verses 19 through, uh, in verses 19 through 20, picking it up at the end of 19, it says that it says they were, they, they were, uh, they were shut, uh, the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. And Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. Jesus came and stood in their midst that he was there. How was he there? The doors were shut. Presumably, the doors were locked. How did, he, how did he get there? Well, he just rose from the grave. I don't think locked doors present that much of a difficulty for Jesus to get through. Now, you'll see people who will, who will uh, look at this text and they'll say, see, uh, this, this means that Jesus really didn't have a body when he was raised. Uh, you know, that's a theory out there, right? You know, that's a theory that some heretical groups entertained. 
That's a theory that they say, well, Jesus rose spiritually. And they will point to verses like this. Uh, but then there's the problem with the fact that he shows them his hands and he shows them his side. And he says, go ahead and take hold. And, and, and they feel him. And he, he, in other texts, he goes ahead and eats. Uh, no, Jesus had a real physical body, and that real physical body uh, came right through the door. However he came through it, he was there with them. Maybe he opened the door and they didn't notice. Maybe he just appeared there. Maybe he just walked right in. And they, uh, who, who knows? But he was there. His people were gathered, and he was there with him. His people were gathered, and they were there. He was there with them. This is really uh, going back to before Christ, before the, the crucifixion. Jesus uh, had said, um, he had said, look, a time is coming when uh, you will not see me, uh, and, and then you will see me. You know, I will not be with you, and then I will be with you. He didn't say that to the, to the, to the Romans, right? He said that to his people, his disciples. He said that I'm going somewhere, and then I'll be back. And he did exactly as he promised. He, 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 had, he had prophesied that he would ri rise from the dead. He would jump up out of the grave, that he would, he, would, he would get up out of the grave. And here he is, back. You see, they had destroyed his temple, but in three days he had rebuilt it. And he was among his, his disciples. And he tells them, and, and, and you've got to love the, the, the words, peace be with you. He says, look, be at peace. Everything's going to be okay. I'm here. Shalom, peace be with you. Um, very similar to the, to the greeting of the angel, right? Do not be afraid. Why? Because I'm terrified. <laughs> be at peace. Why? Because this is not a very peaceful thing. Jesus just pops in and appears. When the last time we saw him, he was hanging on a cross. You got to think Mary was sitting back there saying, I told you so. Who knows? Maybe, maybe she, she was more pious than to say that. I don't know. But, uh, but, uh, but. She thought it though, but Jesus, Jesus is there among them. It says that he appeared, uh, and then Jesus, so he says, "Peace be with you." And, and when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Uh, Pastor Jared this morning talked about fear and joy, and we see that in this text as well, don't we? We see at first they were very much in fear. At first they were very much in fear, but their fear was not, was was uh, more or less misdirected. Now we don't blame them for that. It's a natural thing, but but their fear was on their fear was a fear of the Jews. And yet they were fearing God enough to meet together. And Jesus came and he was among them, and they had great joy. They rejoiced. You know, um, I've I've preached a number of funerals, uh, a lot. I don't know, I've been a pastor for 17 years, I think now. I don't know how many funerals I've preached. Um, and uh, and and with many of the funerals that I've preached, I've also prayed at the bedside of the people who, before they died, uh, and, and uh, prayed with their family as they were going through hospice and things like this. Uh, many times that was the case. Not in every case, but many times that was the case. And, as, in, and um, we, we always, I always anyway, pray for the healing of that person, that, because I believe that God heals. Uh, that's not me being crazy charismatic, but God heals. Uh, he, he, he just does. Um, and... and um, God hasn't always answered that prayer in the way that we have prayed it, because we ultimately pray that God's will be done. Amen? But I've never prayed for anybody to be healed while standing beside their casket. Even though I see people mourning and crying, and it would be really, it would, it, it would, it would satisfy my earthly desire to see, to relieve the suffering of people, to see that person stand up out of the grave like Lazarus did. Well, can you imagine what they thought when that happened? And I want to ease people's suffering. That's what I'm there for. I'm, to, I'm, I'm there to empathize or to sympathize with them and, and help lead them through that grief and counsel them through that. And man, wouldn't it be awesome just to say, you know what? Let's just raise this person from the dead and, and then we can stop all this crying and stuff and we can celebrate. I've never seen that happen because in His providence, God is merciful in allowing us to shed this body in order to prepare us for a new body. You see, the, the wages of sin really is death. And even Lazarus and the widow's son died again. But Jesus, that is not so. Could you imagine how the disappointment just melts away? 
how the how, how the uh, the disciples who had followed invested years of their lives to follow this this leader and and then he he's killed and they're thinking it's all over at least that that's that's a temptation to thought and then all of a sudden there he is standing what is going to stop him now the romans can't do it evidently they tried and there is no stopping christ and they they rejoice they rejoice and by the way brothers and sisters we ought to be of the same mindset. If our God raises the dead, what's going to stop us now? What's going to stop the church of Jesus Christ? Are guns going to stop us? No. Are tanks going to stop us? No. Are nuclear bombs going to stop us? No. Because our God raises the dead. And though they slay us a thousand times, he can raise us right back up. So let us not put our trust in sort of the, 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 the fallacious things of men. Let us not fear what they fear. Because even though he slay me, yet I will see him. And we have confidence in the fact that our God raises the dead. We have nothing to fear. And we see the fear of the Jews melt away at this point. The Jews aren't even mentioned. They're still looking for the disciples. They're still looking for the body of Jesus. Man, it wouldn't be great if they saw it. (laughs) Oh, hi, guys. What? They're still looking for the body of Jesus, and yet he is not to be found by them. Jesus appears to them, and he tells them peace. He, he, he speaks peace to them. But then the next thing that he says, I want you to notice the next thing that he says in verse 21. It says, so Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. We see in this text a sending out of his disciples. We see that Jesus did not just show up at the, at the, the meeting of the, the apostles or the disciples here. He did not just show up there uh, to, to assuage their fears, to, to make them feel better, to make them rejoice. All of those things happen, yes, and praise the Lord. But he has a job for them to do. He has something for them to do. He says, look, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Brothers and sisters, I hope that you came today to celebrate in the Lord, and I hope that you will rejoice through the singing and through the the declaration of the proclamation of the word, through the table, through the the ability to come and, and, uh, and really renew our covenant with the Lord from week to week. I hope and pray that that is your intent and that you are encouraged. But don't just come here to be encouraged. Don't just come here to rejoice. Don't just come here to, uh, to, to simply uh, absorb the, the, the joy of the Lord. I hope that you do that, but I hope that you understand that in, in conjunction with that, there is a sending on His church. You and I are sent into this world. We, he, he did not just get up out of the grave so that we could have a good old time. Well, he did, but it's a good old time in some different ways. He's gotten up out of the grave. Jesus rose. He he was raised in in, in power and glory that we might take word of the resurrection into this world. He has sent us as the Father sent him. Now, I started really, really getting into this a little bit. And man, you should see the list of passages. How did the Father send Jesus? What was the reason that the Father sent Jesus? In what way did the Father send Jesus? And there there are all kinds of different directions that we could go here. But one thing that I found, a common thread that really ran through all of the the text, the the Father sent Jesus to reveal the Father. We see in John 1, the Father sent Jesus um, in in the sense that Jesus was enjoying perfect fellowship with, with the Father, but He sent Jesus to take flesh upon Himself. To, to empty himself by taking it for human nature upon himself and coming to the world. In, in, in a sense, God sent Jesus to a people who were not at all like him. Think about that for just a second. What relevance does that have to missions? 
What relevance does that have to leaving our holy huddle, our Bible bubble, and going out into this world and, and talking to a people who are not like us? Maybe it, we're not talking about just like ethnic differences, right? Fundamentally, the unbelieving world should not be like us. We should be different than that. We should have a different culture, a different language, even if it's the same kind of language, right? We should be speaking in different concepts. We have a different worldview. But, but God is sending us to a people who is not like us that we might do what Jesus did. Now, what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? Well, I want to mention just a handful of, of, of verses. I don't want to camp here too long, but, but I, I want you to see the major sort of theme, the thread, if you will, that binds these things, that unites them, that works through them. Uh, God, God sent Jesus, 1 Timothy tells us, to save sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15, and I don't think they're going to put those up there, um, uh, but, uh, but you can write these down if you'd like to. 1 Timothy 1.15, it says this, It is a trustworthy saying and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost. The sending of Jesus, the reason that the Father sent the Son was to save sinners. That's, uh, that's, that is, in essence, what Jesus came to do. Now, there are many uh, different ways that that was approached. There are many different uh, ways in which that, that took place, ultimately culminating in the cross of Jesus Christ, where, where sin was put to death on a cross. But Jesus came to save sinners. Uh, 1 John 3.8 the one who does sin is of the devil, because the devil sins from the beginning. The Son of God was manifested for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. What are the works of the devil? Sin. Why was the Son of God manifested? To destroy the works of the devil, to destroy sin. You see a common thread? Jesus came to destroy sin. He came to conquer the enemy that is killing you and me. He came to defeat our most virulent foe. And he did it by shedding his own blood. Luke chapter 4, verses 42 and 43. When day came, Jesus left and he went to a secluded place and the crowds were eagerly seeking for him and came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. Everybody wants a little bit more of Jesus, not realizing that everybody needs a little bit of Jesus. So the crowds are saying, hey, Jesus, you stay with us. And Jesus is like, no, I got to go away. Verse 43, he says this, this is Luke chapter 4, verse 43. But Jesus said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. Why did God, why did the Father send the Son? To proclaim the good news, that is, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Do you realize the, the, do you realize the weight of the gospel that we have? It's not just, hey, look, come here, believe on Jesus and get fire insurance. Raise your hand if you're feeling convicted right now and everybody close your eyes, lower your heads. Nobody looking around. We're going to play 15 more rounds of this, this song. And everybody who's feeling convicted, raise your hand. I'm going to hold you hostage until somebody raises their hand. <laughs> Dusty takes one for the team. <laughs> yeah, man, you were looking. It's too late. Yeah, no. Um, it's not just decisionism. Do you follow me? It's not the gospel of decision. It's the gospel of the kingdom. There's a whole different way of life. And the kingdom of God should be manifest through His church on planet Earth, even if you're not post-millennialist. <laughs> what, what can I say? I had to follow Jared to some, <laughs> somehow, you know. <laughs> uh, so the kingdom of God is still manifest on Earth through His people. And it should be. Brothers and sisters, we should not be, we, we should be in the world, but not of the world. You hear people saying that sort of thing all the time, right? What that means is that 
We live among heathens. We, we live among pagans. We too were once like them. And yet God has called us to a newness of life. That doesn't just mean that now we're not going to hell, whereas before we were. What that means is we have a whole different set of priorities. Priorities that are centered around Him rather than around what I want for my life. You know what? You, that, that's what Romans 12 talks about. Offering up your body as what? A living sacrifice. In other words, God, this is my body. Do with it what you want to do. Because what I've chosen to do with it has messed me up. You do what you want to do with it. You see, we should be thinking in a fundamentally different way. We are, Jesus was sent to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, the good news that Jesus is Lord, and the good news is, the, is that, that His people will live forever. Will you turn from your sin, trust in Christ, and be part of his kingdom? The good news is that if you're here today and you still are drawing breath, that's a possibility for you. The good news is that it's not too late. The door's not shut. You're not cut off yet. And I can stand before you even as a Calvinist and say this. Why? Because he's, he's told me to. The good news is, if you turn from your sins, trust in Christ, you will be saved. That is the good news. And He will be your King, and you will be His people. And what a glorious thing that is. God sent Jesus to preach the good news of the kingdom of the gospel. Guess what His disciples need to do? They need to preach the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God. God sent Jesus into the world so that the world would be saved through him. We all know John 3.16. John 3.17 says this, For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world or condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. For salvation is found in no other name, only through Jesus. Buddha cannot save you. Muhammad cannot save you. Joseph, Joseph Smith cannot save you. Krishna cannot save you. You get the point, right? The Holy Roman Father cannot save you. Mary cannot save you. In fact, if Mary were here, she would tell you to look to her son. Because salvation is found only in Christ. In Christ alone. God sent Jesus to the world so that the world might be saved through him. How is the world saved through him? The world is saved through him because he came to destroy the works of the devil. What are the works of the devil? The works of the devil are sin. And so Jesus puts sin to death. And the good news is that if you're a sinner here today, salvation is open and offered to you freely. Turn from your sin and trust in Christ today. And you will be saved and you will be part of his kingdom. And it's a glorious thing. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so also I am sending you. As the Father has sent me, so also I am sending you. You know what that means? That means we need to come to destroy the works of the devil. I mean, obviously we cannot in our flesh pay for sin. That, that doesn't happen. That's not what we're talking about. But what we can do is we can wage war against the sin that dwells in us. What we can do is, is confront those who are in sin what we can do is bring the gospel to bear on sin, which is exactly what will destroy sin in our day. It's no different. The blood of Christ destroys sin in our day, just like it did in Jesus' day. Same sacrifice, same effect. And it's just as powerful as it was then. So brothers and sisters, we have been sent on the mission that God sent Christ on. We have been sent with the same mission. Proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Destroy the works of the devil. Destroy sin. You see, the main point here has to do with saving sinners. The main, the, 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 the main thread that binds all of these things that we've looked at and, 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 and far more than what we've looked at so far. I'm not going to get into all the ones that, I've, that, I, was, that I was looking at. That would be too long. That's never stopped you before. <laughs> the primary objective is to reconcile sinful man to God. 
to destroy sin. It has to do with how we address sin. And we can see that plainly also because of verse 23, which we'll get out shortly here. But I must say this, that churches many times have gotten off into doing different things. I don't know how many Easter eggs I've seen, Easter egg hunts I've seen as I drive uh, past churches. And you know what? It's whatever. I get it. You want to use Easter egg hunts to draw unbelievers in so that you can tell them about Jesus. Brother, I hope that works. Praise the Lord. I hope it works. Um, uh, I'm not comfortable with that sort of thing. Uh, and we will all give an account before the Lord. And so, uh, so, so I, I hope it works. Uh, but at the same time, what we, w- w- churches have gotten off to doing all kinds of different things. And there's been actually a lot of good things that churches have gotten their hands into. Things that aren't necessarily bad. Things like mercy ministries and, and, and things like that. And those things can be good. Jesus healed people. Jesus fed people. He cast demons out of people. He did mercy ministry. So, so we're following in pretty good footsteps when we do those things. But when we do those things at the exclusion of sharing the gospel, if we do those things and we make no reference to Christ, if we do those things as ends in themselves rather than as a means to an end of showing people what, what the solution to their actual most, most significant problem is, the most significant problem that is killing them faster than starvation, that is killing them faster than a drug addiction, and that is sin. Sin will destroy you. And if you breathe your last breath without having reconciled to God, you will be condemned to hell, damned forever. Brothers and sisters, we need to take that seriously. As we do ministry, as we implore people, please be reconciled to God through Christ. We need to take that seriously. But... But he doesn't just leave it there. Sometimes, you know, we can all get ahead of ourselves sometimes. We can see passages like this where it says, just as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. And we can go look all the passages up, you know, the, like even, even what I've done here, even the short, um, even the short study that, that, that I've done. And we can say, okay, let's go. Are you ready? Let's go right now. Let's charge hell with a squirt gun. Mentality. We can we can we can get ahead of what the what the Lord is trying to do with us here. Jesus says, "Yes, as I as I was sent by the Father, I am also sending you." But He doesn't say, "So get out there and go right now." He He, he says, "Pause for just a moment." It says in verse twenty two, and when He had said this. When Jesus tells them, "I am sending you as the Father has sent me," when He says this, uh, He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Now you might notice that today I'm preaching from the Legacy Standard Bible, which is why we have it in that instead of our nifty little easy worship thing, whatever. They don't have a a plug-in for the LSB yet. There's a reason I'm doing that. It's not because I'm, uh, you want to be novel or anything like that. The reason I'm, I'm preaching from the LSB this morning is because I believe that, I sincerely believe that the LSB captures a nuance in this text that is not as readily seen in the ESV. So in the original language, it captures a, a bit of a grammatical nuance here that, that um, I think is important as we understand what Jesus is saying to his disciples. Uh, it, it says when he, he, that he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. And we'll see that in just a moment. I'll bring that up in just a moment. But the first thing that we see here in verse 22 is that Jesus breathes on his disciples. That he breathes on his disciples and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, what is this all about? What is, it, what is he breathing on the disciples for and saying, receive the Holy Spirit? Is this some kind of a proto-Pentecost? Like, are, is the Spirit being conferred to the church before the church has actually been born? Uh, and, you know, there have been some people who believe this. I think one commentator that I read said something along the lines of, uh, well, this is where uh, Jesus gave them the Spirit to indwell them, and then later on the Spirit fills them at Pentecost. And I'm still not really persuaded that's what's going on here. Um, no, I think there's a better explanation for that. And the reason for that 
is because, uh, is because Jesus had told them uh, in John 16, so just a few chapters back, Jesus had said to them, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, because if I don't go away, the advocate, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit there, the advocate, the counselor, the paraclete, right? The, the, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will, I will send him to you. So we see that the Spirit is not given until Jesus is not present. Jesus has to leave before the Spirit comes. So this is not a giving of the Holy Spirit to the church. So what does it mean when he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit? What is he talking about that? Well, I believe that to be a, a, a more or less a, a teaching tool. But it's a teaching tool that they would have understood very, very clearly. And why is that? Well, that, the reason they would have understood it very clear, clearly is because they are very familiar with the Old Testament more so than I would think that most of us are even, probably even all of us. They've been raised on it. They cut their teeth on it. They would have known the, the, the Holy Spirit. They would have known, for example, that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Word of God says, Then Yahweh God formed man out of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And so the man became a living being. When did the man become living being? When the breath of God was breathed into his nostrils. Or Job 33, chapter 33, verse 4, where it says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So the breath of God is what gives people life. That's the, they would have known that. Or perhaps in Ezekiel, chapter 37, verse 9, right? The, 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 the valley of dry bones. Uh, when, when in the valley of dry bones, uh, you know, the, God takes Ezekiel up to the uh, 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 edge of the valley, and he, sa he says, he, there's, there's all kinds of dry bones there, and he says, hey, Hey, uh, prophesy for these things to come together, and they come together, and they form bodies. The bones do. And then, then what does he say? They're, but they're all dead bodies laying in the middle of this valley. And he says, prophesy to the wind. Prophesy to the spirit. Prophesy to the breath. <clears throat> and he says, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. This is in verse 9 of Ezekiel 37. Say to the breath, thus says the Lord Yahweh, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these who were killed that they may come to life. You see, the Old Testament is full of, of passages that talk about the breath of life. And you know what? You, do you know where the breath of life comes from? The breath of life comes from this Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit breathing, and by the way, that, that word in both, uh, both Greek and Hebrew, the word is the same, right? The, 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 the breath or the spirit or the wind. That's the same word. And he, so, so he tells them, breathe, he, he, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. What is he saying? Essentially what Jesus is saying here is that just as the Father breathed breath, or just as the, the Spirit breathed breath into the life of the first living man, so too now I am breathing life into the body of my church. Into the body of my church. And where, where you were dead, where you were marginalized, where you were not a people, now you are a people. And he is, he is, yes, forecasting that which would take place at Pentecost when the Spirit would fall and, and, and come and, and fill and indwell the people of God. You see, throughout all of Scripture, the breath of God is what breathes life. The breath of God is what breathes life into that which is dead and brings life. And Jesus is bringing life to His church. Essentially what He's saying is this. As the Father has sent me, I am now sending you. But you can't go alone. Because you're a dead body and you need life. And the breath of God must fill the, fill the church in order to give them life that they might do what He has, what, what he has called them to do, what He has sent them to do. <clears throat> the breath of God has been given to His church so that, he might, so that the church might live and fulfill her purpose. But what is her purpose? Why is she, what is she supposed to do? She's been sent out. What is, she, what is she going to do? Now, this is why I chose to preach from the LSB this morning. This is why. In verse 23, If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. The you here, and by the way, the, the you here is plural, if you all, we can, say that, we can say that in the southern drawl, right? If y'all, is that all right? It's okay. <laughs> if y'all, if you all, <laughs> see, I'm, I'm from Indiana. I can't even do that right. <laughs> I can't even do that right. If, if y'all forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. But if y'all retain the sins of any, they have been retained. 
if you all, the disciples, and by extension the church that the disciples would found, if you all forgive anyone their sins, then their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain their sins, then their sins have been retained. Now, I know we had a good breakfast this morning, and I know it's kind of warm in here, and you might be tempted to be drifting off right now. I want you to hear what he just said to the disciples. Because he's saying that to you too, and he's saying that to me too. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven, or they have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, then they have been retained. He's talking to the church. Now, I know that certain heresies have built up around this over the years as well. The Roman heresy uh, has, has gone on to, to, to uh, uh, vest in their priests the idea that they can absolve sins. We're not there. <laughs> I have no power in my hands, or you have no power in your hands, or in your prayers, or anywhere else to forgive anyone's sins. We can't absolve the sins of, uh, of people. That, 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 that does not come from us. But, but what exactly is he saying here? Well, there is, there is, certainly, there is certainly an earth-shaking kind of statement that is being made here. Who can forgive sins? What did the Pharisees say? Who can forgive sins? Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. To the paralytic, what did the, what did the Pharisees say? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, that was Jesus' point, by the way. But that's not what Jesus said at the end of that, is it? What did he say? He says, so that you can know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, I say to you, get up and walk. Jesus proclaimed within himself the ability to forgive sins right then and there. And now he is proclaiming to the church the authority to forgive sins as well. How do we do that? And this is where we need to be very, very careful. How does that take place? Well, Jesus has been preparing them for this throughout his ministry anyway, to receive this. For example, back in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, uh, Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Do, do, do you understand the authority that Jesus is giving to his people, to his church? Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Or if you just follow a couple chapters after that, in Matthew 18, where he's talking about the church discipline, and even up to the point of excommunication, he says in Matthew chapter 18, <coughs> excuse me, verses 18 and 19, he says this, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in, in heaven. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done by them by my Father who is in heaven. Here again, we have the same sort of grammatical construction that we see in both places in Matthew and also in John chapter 20 here. Whatever you do here on earth will have been done in heaven. Whatever you don't do on earth will not have been done in heaven. Now, what, what is he communicating here? What Jesus is saying here is that when, when we are sent into this world, and when we take the gospel of the kingdom of God out into this world to destroy the works of the devil, to, to destroy sin, when we, when we go in an effort to do that as part of the ministry of the, of the church of Jesus Christ, when we go to someone and we tell them, that your sins will be forgiven you if you trust in Christ and turn from your sins. We are loosing on earth what has been loosed in heaven, and we are binding on earth what has already been bound in heaven. When we go to someone and we tell them that, look, uh, that regardless of what it is that you have done, that, that, that your sins will be forgiven if you, if you turn away from that sin. You repent. That's the, the biblical word, right? You repent a change in mind and a change in a heart that leads to a changed life and changed actions. When you turn from your sin and you trust in what, what Christ has done for, me, for, for you, then, uh, then, then what has been bound in heaven is being bound right here. In other words, we are simply the messengers who proclaim on earth 
what has already been done in heaven. And we can, with all authority, declare the gospel of the kingdom to people. We can, with all authority, administer the sacraments to people, binding on earth what has been bound in, on, on, in heaven and loosing on earth what has been loosed in heaven. The church has tremendous authority that way. <clears throat> and that's exactly what Jesus is saying to his disciples. If you forgive the sins of any, then they will have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, then they will have been retained. How can you forgive sins? Well, what you can do in order to forgive sins is you can simply point to that, point that person to the source of everyone's forgiveness of sins, that is the blood of Christ. And you can, you can say with all authority and with all confidence and with all sincerity that if they have truly and genuinely trusted in Christ, turning from their sins, then their sins are forgiven. But you can also, with equal assurance, say that if you have not turned to Christ, if you are somehow trusting in the goodness of your own flesh, if you are somehow trusting in the good works of your own hands, if you're somehow trusting in some other God to save you, then you can say with all authority and with all sincerity and with all truthfulness that that person's sins have been retained. And they will answer for them on the day of judgment. You see, we are not a people who goes, who goes up like a, like a 10-year-old, you know, uh, inviting somebody to their birthday party. Oh, I, I want so-and-so to come because they like unicorns. And I want so-and-so not to come because they like monster trucks. Some of y'all are back there thinking, I think it's the other way around. <laughs> yeah, I got too many girls, right? <laughs> well, I was... So, so you got the little 10-year-old who's just going up and arbitrarily making the law for themselves, right? For who gets to come to their birthday party? That's not what we as the church do. We don't arbitrarily make up the rules about who's in and who's out. We declare the Word of God, for He makes the rules. He is the one who has declared the gospel. <clears throat> the place of the church in the world today I have often said, and I think most of you have heard me say it, something to this effect that people don't understand the majesty of the church of Jesus Christ today. They just don't. They just don't. Um, I was reading a book by John Piper. It's um, his book on marriage. Um, this, yeah, this momentary marriage, that's the name of it. Thank you. It's his book on marriage, and I think he begins it out by saying, there's never been a society on planet Earth that has ever that has ever um, honored marriage highly enough. Well, yeah, no kidding. There's never been a society in the, in, in the history of the world that has honored the church as much as it should be honored as, as well. The church of Jesus Christ, even in, even in the medieval period, uh, the church of Jesus Christ where people saw it and feared it, nevertheless, it was an apostate church. It became an apostate church over time. And uh, it, was, it was no longer that church which Jesus founded. <clears throat> in the West, today, the church has been reduced to something like a country club or a special interest group. Uh, the church of Jesus Christ is thought of as, at best like a social gathering, some sort of seller of religious services. Uh, or it may be at worst, they're, they're thought of as a bigoted social scourge in the enemy of the people's liberty. That's, that's what the people of this world think of the church of Jesus Christ. The people for which Christ gave his blood. In contrast, the scripture speaks of the church as glorious, as beautiful, as pure, as something, as, as that which Christ has died for. He's nurturing her. He's, he's washing her clean with his own blood, with his word. She is the church of the risen Savior, and she has more authority and power than this world knows. She has the keys to the kingdom. <clears throat> the President of the United States 
is not the leader of the free world. He's not. He never has been. The only thing that the various presidents of the United States have ever done throughout your lifetime is to, some of them more quickly and some of them less quickly, lead you into slavery. That's not what a leader of a free people does. The leader of the free world is the church of Jesus Christ. And that is because true freedom only comes in Christ and through Christ. Apart from Christ, there is nothing but chains. Apart from Christ, there is nothing but slavery. Freedom will not be found apart from Him. I don't care which political party you, you like. The church is arguably the single most important institution in all of human history. Now, that might ruffle some of your feathers. You like what I said about the, the politics. But it might ruffle some of our feathers to say that the church is arguably the most single important institution of human history. But let me explain. The civil authority is important, but it does not have the keys to the kingdom. The civil authority is a temporal authority only. And so it will deal with you for maybe 100 years, and that is a blip, less than a blip in light of eternity. Some might even get a little bit more biblical, although civil authority is biblical. But some might get a little bit more biblical, and they might say, well, family, that's the most important institution that God has ever made. Oh, is it? The family is certainly important. It absolutely is important. It has, the, the, it has a certain sphere of authority of its own. And it, uh, it, it is very, very important to fulfill the obligations of that sphere. But Jesus came in such a way that a man's enemies will be of his own household. You understand what, what that verse means? What that verse means is when it comes to the difference, when it comes between you choosing between your church and your blood kin, you're to choose your church. You're to choose the church of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says, look, uh, for those who have left their family for the cause of God, and that was a reality. That wasn't just a, oh, I don't like my family, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, go to church and then use that as an excuse to ignore them. No, that was, I'm going to make every opportunity to love my family, to convert my family. But when my family puts that, lay, you know, lays down the law and says, it's either us or Jesus, then you got to choose Jesus. When they make it clear that they're going to abandon you and leave you, if you continue with your relationship with Christ, then you let them leave and abandon you. That's scary. Yeah, but you know what Jesus promised, right? Whoever leaves their family, they're going to have a hundred times more family. You know where that hundred times more family is? It's the church of Jesus Christ. Because when our family pushes us out and pushes us away because of Christ, we have family to whom we can turn. And brothers and sisters, we have more in common with one another than we do with our next of kin if our next of kin is not a believer. <clears throat> we have a blood that unites us that is thicker than our genetics. Although somewhere down the road, we're related there too. Family is important, but you understand that, you understand that once we die, we're not going to be married in heaven. You understand that once your children uh, get old enough and they, they, they enter the covenant of marriage themselves and they leave your house, they're no longer bound to you in the same way. Now, they do have to honor you. They're required to do that. But there is a new allegiance that they have to their spouse that now they, they break away from your family. In other words, your, your family is temporary and it's, it, and it's temporary to this life. Now, we will be brothers and sisters in the church forever. So the church is arguably the single most important institution in human history. It possesses the most important trust of any institution populated by human beings, and that is the trust of the keys of the kingdom. All other institutions are temporal. And so when Jesus tells us, when he tells us that if you forgive the sins of any, it is forgiven, it has been forgiven, if you retain the sins of any, it has been retained. That's an important, an important authority that we have. A critical one that we must take into the world. And yes, we need to take it to our families. And yes, we need to take it to the civil authorities. But we also need to take it to every other facet of our network anywhere. And we need to share, we need to proclaim that gospel. <clears throat> yes, we bind and loose. Yes, 
we, we, we forgive and we retain. But what has been bound, or what we bind has been bound, what we loose has been loosed by heaven. You see, the authority comes from heaven. The authority doesn't rest with us. The authority comes from heaven. The forgiveness comes from heaven. It doesn't, it doesn't rest with us, though we declare it. The retaining, it comes from heaven. We just simply declare it. But we are sent as the Son is sent to declare these things. And we are sent in the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus Christ has been raised. Amen? Jesus Christ has sent the Spirit and breathed life into His people. Jesus Christ has sent us as the Father has sent Him. We are empowered by the Spirit of God. We are to minister the gospel of the kingdom. We are to forgive whom God has forgiven and retain the sins of those whom God says that their sins are retained. Brothers and sisters, that is our charge. That is our privilege. And that is the blessing that we have, that, that we have to, to go forth in the power of the resurrection and do these things. Uh, may we be faithful in doing them. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the charge that you have given your church. And we pray, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit even now, that your church would be a living church, that your church, Lord, would proclaim the gospel of your kingdom, that as, as you were sent, Lord Jesus, we, we would recognize our 